Okay, so now we get to the, the really important part of the program. Uh, so I'm Sandy Pendlin, uh, faculty here, one of the core faculty in IDS, IDSS, which I'm glad to be. Um, and I live in this building here. So I do things that are a mixture of both uh, experimental and theory, uh, and really very, very happy to see IDSS so that we can really revolutionize this idea of understanding our social systems by developing the sort of theory that applies to distributed asynchronous systems that we have today. So it's a very exciting time. It's a time to make uh, a lot of, uh, of change in the world. Um, and to show what's going to happen, we're going to have talks by uh, some 20 of the graduate students who are the ones that are going to actually do all the good work. Um, and we've decided to make this something where it's 90 seconds each. Name, what they're doing, why you should come and see it. And then they're going to be out there at their posters uh, where you should go and talk to them and learn about the future. OK? So you guys ready? OK, let's go. Hi, uh, I'm Marzia Gassimi. I'm a PhD student in the computer science department here at CSAIL. And I work on doing representation learning for clinical data sets. So I'm going to argue that this is good for two reasons. And the first reason is that clinical data is very interesting. You can learn really interesting things about the human health and what sort of intervention somebody might need, what causes people to get ill, how they progress through illness. Those are all really important things that you might want to learn about. The second reason is because it's just worse data. And bear with me for a second. So think about any other data that we might learn on. So Yelp reviews are made by humans to be read by other humans. Or Amazon data, that's purchase information and then it's put back on the internet for you so that you as a human can read it and use it. Some of the worst data ever created is healthcare data. And so some of the most interesting challenges in machine learning are available in healthcare data. And if you don't believe this, you can ask any clinician that's in the audience and look at some of their notes. Clinical notes are the worst. It's terrible, right? We all know this. So if you're interested in uh, representation learning and clinical data and figuring out how we can predict important risks for human health, come by my poster. Thank you. Great. And 14 seconds there. OK, next, come on up. Hi, my name is Jennifer, and I work on a project about designing analog to digital converters for low power circuits to use in applications like wearable medical devices. Okay, and this is a project that we are doing in collaboration with circuit researchers in, in MTL and researchers like myself who work on information theory. Okay, so it turns out that we were able to discover a rather happy coincidence that key ideas in classical information theory is actually the right viewpoint to look at this problem about analyzing ADCs. So for example, in information theory, you, would, you wouldn't want to use a lot of bits to represent data, which you, were pretty, you knew with pretty high certainty. So similarly, when you're digitizing analog signals, you also don't want to use a lot of comparisons to figure out what the signal is if you knew likely what that signal was going to be. So for example, if your input stream has a lot of zeros in it, likely the next sample is also going to be zero. So you want to use this to your advantage when you do your ADC algorithm. So even though there is no compression in the ADC process, compression algorithms with a minor tweak actually turn out to be the key to reducing the costly comparison cycles and increasing power efficiency. So while the project that I'm working on is able to make impacts in uh, low power circuits, it also has the added significance of giving core information quantities like entropy a new characterization of being the fundamental limit of circuit compare, uh, sorry, being the fundamental limit of the minimum number of comparisons needed in ADCs. Okay, there we are. Important stuff. Next. 
Hello, my name is Christina, and I'm presenting joint work with Dagin Song, Ihua Li, and Dev Rasha, um, titled Nonparametric Regression for Latent Variable Models via Collaborative Filtering. So consider a recommendation system that might want to learn a function that maps from a user type and movie type to a particular rating. And say if we actually knew the user type and we knew the movie type, then we could just apply standard uh, regression techniques to fit a fu function to the data. However, in many uh, of these settings, so, uh, the, the type is actually latent, we don't observe it. So what we have to do is we, we have to first uh, estimate the similarity between uh, the users, and um, it turns out in our work we show that w within a fairly general model that you can actually approximate this distance in the latent space using um, an uh, average squared difference between the commonly rated movies. And, and once we have this, uh, this similarity, we can then leverage local approximation techniques to fill in the missing entries. And um, in fact, we were able to, um, so, so this work actually leads to a, a variant of the collaborative filtering, and we were able to analyze and improve bounds on the mean squared error, uh, leading to some insights on why collaborative filtering has been so successful in practice. Um, this has applications to other areas as well, so come by and talk to me about it. <laughs> Great, thank you. Hi everyone, my name's Shomesh. I'm a PhD student in electrical engineering and also a member of the Laboratory for Financial Engineering here at MIT. My research focuses on applying signal processing to study financial time series. Specifically, standard statistical methods in finance don't distinguish between short and long-term components of measures like risk and co-movement. And so we apply spectral analysis to create uh, frequency-specific measures of alpha, beta, correlation, and volatility. And we show that these change not only across time, but also across frequencies. So this has important implications for forecasting, um, performance attribution, portfolio management, and risk control. So if you're interested in learning more, um, come talk to me after the session. Thank you. Great. We'll figure out how to make real money here. OK, good. Thank you. Hello, my name's Joshua Mueller, and I work with Jessica Transic. And the title of my poster is The Value of Storage Technologies for Wind and Solar Energy. In this project, we take a new approach to compare the benefits and costs that storage, uh, energy storage can provide to wind and solar plants uh, to help them capture periods of high prices. And we look at a diverse range of storage technologies, ranging from mechanical systems, such as pumped hydro storage and compressed air energy storage, to electrochemical batteries and flow batteries. And we look at a number of locations and find that at the low end of cost estimates, uh, some storage technologies can increase the profitability of wind and solar power in locations such as Texas and California. Importantly, we find that across all locations, the relative value of storage technologies is the same, uh, meaning that those technologies that produce, provide the most value in one location also provide the most value in other locations. And finally, we find that as solar and wind generation costs decline, uh, this necessitates a further decline in, in cost improvement uh, for storage technologies. Thank you. Good. You're keeping the lights on. That's great. Ma'am. Hi, IDSS. Um, my name is Magdalena Klimun. I work with Jessica Transic. The title of my poster is Mitigating the Methane Impacts of CO2-Focused Energy Policies. And one of the key takeaways of this work is that to meet climate change mitigation targets in the near and long term, we need to make sure we really understand the expectations about technological change in the energy sector that are built into some of these targets. Um, for instance, how quickly we expect uh, methane leakage from devices along the natural gas supply chain um, to be mitigated over time. And my poster provides an example for this problem in the US, where the combination of current climate policy goals um, very likely implies rates of methane mitigation that we did not observe in data in the past. Thank you. Awesome. And, and under a minute. She's the champion so far. OK. Hey, I'm Zach Nudell. I also work in Jessica Transix Lab. And my overall research goal is to evaluate different transportation technologies as potential tools to reduce carbon emissions. And specifically here, I am 
looking at uh, range limitations in battery electric vehicles with the idea of trying to better understand how much of a constraint those range limitations provide on widespread EV adoption. Um, and so to understand the question from a system-wide level, you definitely have to consider realistic travel behavior. So if an electric vehicle is gonna meet my range needs on a given day, it really matters how far I need to drive on that day. But it also ends up being really important to consider variations in second-by-second -second driving behavior and vehicle performance, because the same vehicle can achieve very different ranges under different operating conditions. Um, and so to better answer those questions, we um, pulled data from a lot of different places to build a comprehensive model of personal vehicle energy requirements across the United States, and then we can um, choose existing on-the-market electric vehicles and plug them into the model and um, evaluate how they perform both across the U.S. as a whole and in individual cities. Um, and we can, we can look at potential improvements in battery technology with the idea of better understanding how much these technologies need to improve in order to allow the kind of widespread adoption that is required in climate change mitigation goals. Great. Thank you. Good. Next. There you go. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Amanda Jang. I'm a PhD student in IDSS and a graduate of the Technology and Policy Program, and I work with Professor Noel Celine. And the work I'm presenting today is about leveraging environmental monitoring network data for policy evaluation. So the question that motivates this work is, how can we actually tell if our pollution policies are working? And the case study we focus on is mercury, policy, uh, mercury pollution policy in the Great Lakes region. So this is an area that's really vulnerable to mercury pollution. And we use a combination of modeling and qualitative empirical approaches. Um, and so something that we've heard from our community partners in this research is that the policy process doesn't just stop at implementation. We really need to think about whether these policies, once implemented, are actually effectively achieving their environmental goals. So in this work, we're investigating whether we can detect signals of mercury policy change in the Great Lakes region, in the monitoring data, given noise from factors like variability in weather. Um, and so then we try to think through some of the implications of these signal and noise challenges for both policy evaluation and also adaptive policy design. So if you're interested in the environment, uh, policy assessment, the Great Lakes region, or any combination of these things, uh, please come talk to me. Great. Okay. Good. Hi, everyone. My name is Gökshin Kavlak. Um, I'm working with Professor Jessica Transig. Um, the title of my poster is uh, metals, Growth in Metals Production for Rapid Photovoltaics Deployment. Uh, in this work, I'm modeling the material requirements of different uh, solar PV technologies to better understand their scalability. The methodological highlight of this work is that we use historical data for a large set of metals to inform our thinking about the future. Um, this data set uh, captures the past behavior of the metals production sector and also helps us to uh, identify the common features across metals and across time. Um, we find that um, the scalability of thin film PV technologies is limited because they use very scarce materials uh, for these technologies to provide even a small percentage of the global electricity in 2030, uh, we need to ramp up the production of these scarce materials, like tellurium, uh, at an unprecedented rate, uh, which is a rate that would exceed the past growth rates observed by uh, this large set of metals. And in contrast, uh, we find that um, the most ubiquitous uh, PV technology in the market today um, Silicon-based PV uses uh, this abundant material, silicon, and is much more scalable. Um, and it can actually provide up to 25% of the global electricity in 2030 uh, without exceeding uh, the past growth rates. Okay. okay, hi everyone. My name is Alfredo Morales. I'm collaborating with Professor Pentland. And our poster, uh, we studied uh, the social phenomenon of social segregation, but not from a traditional point of view, which is mostly based in how people or houses or homes are distributed in the city, but more on the behavioral side of it. So how different a people's behavior is according to the political preferences or income. And for this purpose, we analyzed multiple types of human activities, like purchase activity, Twitter online activity, urban mobility, and we found that people's behavior is highly determined 
by their uh, income and the places from the city that they, that they come from, and especially in their online behavior, which is highly segregated. And this is surprising because one might think that with these new technologies, you can talk with everyone and they will act like a place for people to meet and interact and mix. But in reality, we are noticing something different. If you let people choose who they interact with, they self-segregate and in a very high uh, level. So if you're interested in social segregation, please come see and discuss with me. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Ali. I'm a student at Leeds working with Asu Ozdaglar. Uh, and if you stop by my poster, I will talk about our work with Jaron Asamoglu and Azar Akhshmalikyan uh, about the effect of information on traffic congestion. So basically, we identify and characterize a paradoxical situation in which uh, providing more information to drivers uh, increases their traveling time. And uh, we also provide some guidelines to avoid such uh, inefficiencies. Um, thank you. Great. We have a new winner for shortest presentation here. Hello, my name is Iman Jahani, and I work with Professor Pentlan and Professor Aral. And my poster is about uh, diversity, communication diversity, and its interaction with bandwidth, social strength of social ties, and income, economic outcomes. So uh, the seminal work by Granovetter and Burt states that uh, weak ties tend to be social bridges to a structural, across a structural homes to communities that provide access to novel information. And therefore, people with uh, weak ties tend to perform better in terms of economic outcomes. However, weak ties also have the disadvantage that they come at a cost of limiting bandwidth or social tie. Therefore, they will limit the uh, success rate of information exchange across the social tie. So we, we think that there is this interaction, there's this trade-off between diversity and bandwidth. And uh, this becomes particularly important in the environments that the nature of the information is complicated. So um, we think that structural diversity is useful so long as it matches the complexity of the information. So the co contributions are twofold. First, we show that there's a strong correlation between diversity measured in terms of heterophily, diversity of alters, and diversity of the ego, and also the diversity of the uh, uh, social interactions. And, uh, uh, and then second and, second and most importantly, we show that the, um, there, the, we provide evidence for this uh, tra uh, band tra trade-off uh, between bandwidth and, uh, and diversity. And in, we, show, we use that uh, in terms of the education level, and we show that based on the education level, the diversity uh, reduces. Okay. Good. Thanks. Here we go. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Amin, and uh, I work with uh, Ali Jad Babai. I will be presenting our work uh, on group decision making. We focus on a scenario when uh, people want to make a decision and benefit from each other's information in making that decision. Uh, a good example is uh, jurors are trying to come up with a, uh, with a recommendation for the court after being exposed to court proceedings. They all have some uh, observations and then they try to uh, deliberate on that uh, and then uh, aggregate their private information and come up with the best decision given what they have observed uh, together. Uh, so we analyzed such uh, scenarios and it turns out there are uh, several inefficiencies uh, associated with such interactions and also the question of uh, unanimity, uh, how to come up with a decision that everybody would agree with, whether they get certain about something despite their limited initial information. And uh, all these, uh, if you're interested in uh, features of group decision making, uh, I would be happy to explain more on my poster. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yen. I'm a researcher in human dynamics group directed by Professor Pentland and Media Lab. The title of my poster is The Ripple Effect You Are More Influential Than You Think. We all have the experience um, that um, we know the uh, six degree of separation, which means that um, we can connect to all, all the other one in the world within only six hops. So in today's world, actually, we're not only connected with, with each other, we're also influenced by the behavior of people surrounding us. But the problem is, um, to what extent are we influenced? 
We all have the experience that if we like drop a stone in the water, we'll see the ripple expanding across it. So this drives us to think whether this ripple effect also exists in social networks. So in our project, we used the large scale um, passively collected mobile phone data in Andorra to quantify the social influence in people's decision making on whether to attend a large scale social event or not. Specifically, after controlling for homophily, our results show that um, there is social influence decays over communication structure, um, intensity, and time timeliness. Um, specifically, we also show that social influence after direct contact drops dramatically, but perceives up to six hops, which may indicate that we could potentially influence people whom we do not even know. So if you're interested, please come to my poster and we, we could discuss more. Great. Oh, perfect. Okay. So hi everyone, my name is Mathieu Daon and I'm a third year PhD student uh, in the Computational Science and Engineering program. So my background is both in mathematics and uh, engineering and I'm particularly interested in applying optimization and game theory to uh, questions uh, regarding failures in infrastructure networks. So the poster I'm presenting uh, this event is um, about security um, games on infrastructure networks. And uh, I lost what I wanted to say. <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, yes, so some of the research questions that we want to address are, for example, uh, which network components are um, vulnerable to strategic disruptions, and also how to design uh, strat um, operating strategies to improve the performance uh, against these failures. So this uh, project is, um, um, yes, so this research is motivated uh, by the need of improving the security of these um, uh, infrastructure networks uh, against, um, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, against, uh, sorry, a strategic opponent. And yeah, so since I will run out of time, uh, if you want to know more about this uh, project, come talk to, uh, to me in, my, uh, in front of my poster. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Andy. Hi, I'm Morgan Frank, and I'm interested in part in how artificial intelligence and society interact. Uh, so uh, it, for the first time in 2014, over half the world resided in cities, and job opportunities have been found to be a major reason for this. Meanwhile, imminent automation technologies promise to remove certain routine tasks and thus change the job landscape in cities. So um, it, the, the question is, uh, will cities continue to dominate, or to the contrary, because of automation, will urbanization decrease? What we find is that small cities are more susceptible to change as a result of automation compared to large cities, which exhibits uh, biased specialization on jobs and skills that are very technical and require workers that both use and improve cutting edge technology. Uh, we are able to demonstrate that, or we're able to demonstrate some evidence that automation could could be driving these technical workers towards cities, making the cities bigger, and that cities are better prepared to uh, harbor these technical workers and thus produce more automation. Thanks. Great. <laughs> um, hello, my name is Hong Nguyen. So um, our project is about the security of the power system. So we look at renewable energies may have to reduce uh, fossil fuel consumption. But at the same time, it introduced a um, very technical issue. For example, it depends on the weather, so the uh, production will in vary and it changes the operational um, point, what it call the equilibrium. So one interesting question is whether we can find with the extent the injection can make the equilibrium disappear. So we introduce a technique which is cable efficient and um, to clarify the domain in which we can apply to other problem like security, constraint, optimal power flow. So come to my poster and we talk more detail. Thank you. And last but not least. Hello, everyone. I'm Ian Schneider. I'm a PhD student at IDSS, and I work with Munzer Dalai and Marta Vidruz Bahani. And I'm presenting work today that we did on 
the optimal bidding strategies for wind producers in electric power markets. So because of the physical constraints of electric power markets, or of electric power systems, we usually run two markets. There's a real-time market, and then another one that happens 24 hours in advance, which we call the day-ahead market. And wind producers are usually forced to bid in these day-ahead markets, so they're forced to enter into a forward binding contract 24 hours in advance, but they don't actually know how much electricity they can expect to produce the, the following day. Uh, so there's this problem, is, which is, you know, given a probability distribution of my wind availability, what should I bid in a day-ahead market? And some previous theoretical work looked at this for wind producers when the penalties were sort of random and exogenous. But I think it's actually more appropriate to think of those penalties as being influenced by the bidding strategies of the wind producers. Because if we look at the data, there actually is an effect from demand error and wind forecast errors on the real-time prices, or the deviation between the real-time prices and the day-ahead prices. It turns out that when wind producers consider the sort of the rational strategies of other wind producers in the system, they can bid in a less conservative way because if other wind producers in the market are bidding more conservatively, it kind of prevent, it, it allows for some buffer in terms of their own bidding behavior. And I think even more interestingly, when all wind producers bid in this fashion, when we formulate it as a game and solve that system, we actually see better trade-offs in terms of risk and efficiency in terms of how the wind producers bid and the total error in their uh, wind forecasts in those bids. Thank you. Great. Okay. So that's it for the uh, poster introductions. And now comes time to actually talk to these folks, see what they're doing, and uh, have some refreshments. Thank you all. <laughs>